Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. And today, our topic is the historical Adam. Now, the context for this discussion has been the recent um, debate and interaction that's taken place over how important Adam is theologically, particularly within uh, evangelical circles. And we hope today to cover only the theological, biblical side of this discussion, the hermeneutics involved, uh, take a look at some of the passages. We're quite aware that this discussion involves science as well as theology, uh, but none of the experts with me today are scientists, and so we don't feel uh, expertise in that regard. Our hope is in the future to bring to the table um, some people with scientific background to discuss that aspect of the question. But we do think it's important to know what the texts of the Bible and what Second Temple Jewish texts are saying about Adam. And so we're going to uh, focus our discussion uh, there today. With me today are, uh, to my immediate right, uh, Mark Bailey, who is president of Dallas Theological Seminary but also teaches in the Bible Exposition Department here. To my immediate left is Dr. Elliot Johnson, uh, who is professor in Bible Exposition as well. And then to my far right is Robert Chisholm, who's chair of the Old Testament Department here at Dallas. Uh, and then, uh, by the genius of technology, Nathan Holstein, who's in the systematic theology department here at Dallas, is speaking to us from his home for reasons that should be obvious because there was no room at the end <laughs> for Nathan here around the table. And so we decided that uh, the best way to bring him in would be uh, through technology. Um, you will uh, observe that several of the participants at the table today uh, also participated in a chapel that we had last semester that also discussed this issue. Uh, that chapel will be posted alongside uh, this podcast, and so you will be able to interact with it as well. And to some degree, we'll be assuming some of the discussion of that chapel in what we do today. So those are the preliminaries. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to be here. Um, to it's be a here. privilege to have you uh, with us today, and I'm just going to dive right in by taking uh, a look at and beginning with Genesis 1. We wouldn't have this discussion uh, <laughs> if we did not have this chapter, uh, and the chapters, the early chapters of Genesis, particularly Genesis 1 to 3, where we get the creation of humanity uh, at the end of the creation week, we get uh, the discussion of the creation of Adam and Eve in chapter 2, and then we get what has become known theologically as the fall in Genesis 3. So I want to uh, begin first uh, thinking about this um, from an Old Testament point of view, and I'm going to ask Dr. Chisholm to begin and, and take us into, lead us into how Adam is seen in these three chapters, particularly uh, particularly around some of the questions that get debated about, about who Adam is. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, when God says, let us make Adam in our image, as you read on, uh, you discover that Adam, the word Adam, Adam, is being used for humankind. In fact, in Net Bible, we translated it that way. In verse 27, God created Adam, humankind, in his own image. And then it says, male and female, he created them. So Adam is, consists of both male and female in Genesis chapter 1. When you move into Genesis 2 and 3, now Adam is going to be used for the man, the male, who is created. Uh, and then God says, well, it's not good for him to be by himself, so I will make a companion uh, corresponds to him, and then he makes the woman. So there's a difference in the use of the term Adam as we move from chapter 1 into chapters 2 and 3. Okay, and uh, the, the big discussion is, or a discussion, obviously, and this gets into hermeneutics, and uh, Elliot, you said you wanted to discuss the hermeneutics of this, uh, but first I'll ask a question, then we'll talk about the hermeneutics. 
One of the great discussions surrounding the early chapters of Genesis, of course, is uh, whether we should see this as uh, a portrayal of a figure, a specific figure, or whether there's something else at a literary level going on. Uh, as an Old Testament person, discuss, if you would, um, that question. Well, some would argue that God didn't create an individual. What we're talking about is a race that's created. If you just had Genesis 1, you could probably make a decent case for that. But then you get into chapter 2 and you see that, well, there is an individual man and an individual woman. And as I pointed out in the chapel uh, a panel discussion that we had, when you read those chapters carefully, present reality is being explained in light of past events. We call that etiology. There's an explanation for origins of things. And I think that in chapters 2 and 3, the historicity of Adam, the individual, is assumed. Uh, for the etiology, that explanation of reality to work, the event has to have taken place. And the characters are important. Even the snake mm -hmm. are important. And I think an ancient Israelite reader would understand there was a literal man named Adam, an individual, uh, who was married to a woman named Eve. There was even a snake that came into play because pl present reality with regard to snakes <laughs> is explained in those sections. So how do we explain that difference? Well, when you get to chapter 5, I think the two strands, if we could call them that, are brought together because in 5.1, it says, when God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. When they were created, he blessed them and named them Adam. So that's that sounds more like Genesis 1. That's humanity. Right. Okay. But then when you continue on, when Adam had lived 130 years, mm -hmm. he fathered a son in his own likeness. Now Adam is being referred to as the individual, the male. That's chapters 2 and 3, the way Adam is used there. So uh, chapter 5 kind of brings that usage together. And so to me, the easiest way to synthesize this material is to argue that in chapter 1, when it uses Adam in that way, it's still referring to the, the man and woman that are then created in 2 and 3. 2 and 3 kind of uh, explain uh, in more detail what's going on in chapter one. So if we were directing a movie, the first the, <laughs> the opening scene would be the panoramic scene of humanity, and then we would zoom in, and in zooming in we'd look particularly at Adam and Eve. Yes, but I would say in chapter one, humanity, even in chapter one, would be Adam and Eve initially. Right, because they're yeah, both it's created It's not a broader the, group that we're <clears throat> zeroing in on two of them. They're That's, both created in the image of God. Right. Right. Yeah. It's interesting in in those opening five chapters, Adam is mentioned uh, by name uh, seven times and by the designation as the man, twenty one times, mm -hmm. and so you get that unify, unity between those two terms, uh, both by direct reference and by a generic the man, mm -hmm. and so it's not just the humankind or the group. Uh, right. It is an individual that's being described. Mm -hmm. now, but Adam is used in different ways when is. you go from one to two and three. Right. And I'm even willing to say that that can be attributed to use of sources. Moses could have used sources, in, mm -hmm. especially in putting Genesis together mm -hmm. uh, when he's describing events that occurred long before his time. Um, so that may explain the, 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 the literary variation that right. we see. But I think when the, when the material is brought together into a unified whole that we have, uh, there, it's it's harmonized, you know. It's harmonized. Well, obviously, Genesis lays an important um, foundation for what we're going to be talking about. Let's talk a little bit about uh, hermeneutical concerns, or at least uh, initially raise them now. Uh, Elliot, yeah, in, or, in broad in broad terms, we're being so specific in identifying the origin of Adam because we want to lay the foundation that that's what the Scripture teaches. Mm -hmm. That's not always been our discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, early on, when the Copernicus issue emerged, mm -hmm. it really wasn't a question of what science taught and what the Bible taught. It was really a question of what science had interpreted and what those who interpreted the Bible had found. And in fact, they were saying more than the Bible. The Bible never said what they were saying about the earth and the sun. And so we're going to be very concerned 
to find exactly what the Bible does teach. And so the point that you're making here is, is that even though there was a long history of interpretation in reading the Bible in a certain way, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way the Bible should have been read? That's correct. And we need to validate, just as the Copernicus conclusions were validated as correct, and the church's interpretation of the Bible was shown to be in error, we have to be very careful today to make sure our interpretation is validated as correct. So the point of the exercise that we're going through, the point that you're making is, is that by paying careful attention to the texts, we have to see how they are read, how they're being read, and whether or not in the long run uh, that reading makes sense internally in terms of what's going That's on correct. with the Bible, but also uh, beyond that, how that relates to uh, to the way – and this is an important part of the discussion too – how science is being interpreted. We have to also recognize that there are interpretations associated with science and, and that the given reading of how science operates in a particular period isn't necessarily – always a reflection of the way the reality The is. reality actually is. Yeah, right. And we need to be responsible in our process of interpretation. It's kind of interesting in a current discussion on, say, the age of the earth. Just because the Bible has days in the creation story and has numbers in the genealogy of Genesis 5 and 11 does not indicate that the Bible is saying the earth was created so many years ago, precisely. That's not what the Bible is teaching. That's not what the Bible is trying to communicate. On the other hand, the Bible is trying to communicate that Adam and Eve were the source of all life in the human race. And that is at least in distinction to some of the conclusions that science is raising at this point. If we could go to that Copernicus point, mm -hmm. they were arguing on the basis of the Bible mm -hmm. that the sun went around the earth. Mm -hmm. But I think if you look at the passages that describe the sun as if it were going around the earth, no theological truth is built on that. They were just assuming that this language of appearance, which everyone kind of accepted at that point in time, was true. But there's no theological construct that's developed from that. We're arguing that in the case of Adam and Eve, and even the snake, there is a theological construct there. This is what I'm, I'm going to get back to this etiological argument. Present reality is interpreted in light of these events. If the events didn't happen, then the theology of the text breaks down. So hermeneutically, I think there's a difference there. Uh, it's an important difference, yes. I think. Is yes, it is. really is. Yeah. Yeah. Nathan, you have anything you want to observe as we uh, wrap up our discussion on Genesis and turn to some other texts? Yeah, I, I, I would absolutely agree with what uh, has been said so far. When we're talking about the Copernican Revolution, we're talking about a principle that, that doesn't uh, form a, a foundational part of that system of thought. Um, we, we speak of uh, the depth of ingression in, in any system of thought to indicate how foundational that principle might be. Okay, I have no <laughs> idea what the depth of ingression would be. So, so you're going to have to, and if I have no idea, I guarantee you our audience is, is certainly at a loss. Theology speaks. They're in egress at the moment. When we have a question about a house, okay. is it a problem with a shingle or is it a fault in the foundation? Hmm. Um, it's obvious that one is a minor problem and the other is a, a very critical problem. W when we're talking about does the sun revolve around the earth, theologically, that, that's a shingle. Hmm. That's not a, a, a terribly important principle. Whereas <clears throat> now when we talk about the historicity of Adam, uh, and we're going to talk about this more later, but, but we have a principle here that is critically connected to, to principles that are essentially Christian. And so, yeah, we have to be careful um, when we play with the foundation. Um, and, and I think that's what I'm hearing Dr. Johnson and Dr. Chisholm say. I, I completely agree. So just to review, as we come out of Genesis, we have in the first chapter the, the creation of humanity focused in a male and a female. In chapter two, we have a focus on the creation first of Adam and then Eve from him. And then in chapter 3, we have the failure of Adam to obey God, which leads to a whole series of consequences. Um, 
the snake now will crawl on the ground. There will be enmity between the woman and the snake and what the snake represents. I did that very, very carefully. <laughs> uh, and, uh, 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 and, and so there's an impact. Uh, woman a, will suffer pain Woman will suffer and pain in childbirth. Uh, uh, it's going to take labor to mm-hmm. bring forth food. There are just a whole series of And in the end, we die. And in the end, we die. It's <laughs> minor. Right. Not minor detail. Um, and, and so there are a whole series of consequences. This is theologically, of course, been labeled as the fall. Yes. And, uh, and, and when we talk about foundation, we're in the early chapters of the book of Genesis. We're laying the foundation of the story story of Scripture uh, by what is said here, and the dilemma of Adam's failure is literally a shadow that casts itself across the entire rest of the canon. Uh, the story Very moves good. on from there. Uh, it picks up uh, steam, if you will, in chapter 12 with the promise to Abraham that God is going to begin to move to deliver us out of this dilemma in which we find ourselves, and we're off and running into the history of Israel and eventually the story of the Messiah and everything that's tied to Jesus. So that, and isn't it interesting that at the very end in Revelation you have Eden imagery used to take uh, us to back, describe the restoration, take us back no to where death. we started. Uh, a Garden of Eden imagery, right, uh, is is used there in a positive way. So it's also yes. interesting the way everything is tied to the genealogy of chapter five. One Jewish commentator said this: "This is the record of the line of man mm-hmm. by tracing all humanity back to a common parentage." This phrase conveys the presupposition of the absolute unity and equality of the human race as created by God. And so what, what, I, what I've been trying to do with this summary is to unpack what uh, Dr. Holstein meant, or Nathan, I'm going to use first names, uh, <laughs> met uh, when they said uh, – when he said this is Christian. And actually I would say it's Judeo-Christian. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's Christian and it's all, it, it also is rooted in the theology of Judaism at the same time. <clears throat> okay. let, me raise, let me raise one more, okay. Daryl, from the Genesis account, and that is the phrase, the image of God, the Imago mm-hmm. Dei, because that's, that's foundational mm. to the theology that we will talk about throughout the scriptures, and that's both an Old Testament and a New Testament affirmation. Uh, you have it in Genesis uh, 1, 16, as well as in verse 27. You have it uh, alluded to again uh, in chapter 4, where as Adam was created in the image of God, uh, Cain and Abel were created in his image, and you get the re- reproduction of that. And that gets affirmed in 1 Corinthians eleven four, as well as in James chapter 3 and verse 9. And so both the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the intertextuality of the Imago Dei, that's found, interesting enough, in the foundational chapters. So it goes back to Bob's statement that what you have stated as the theological implications in history are must therefore be rooted in history. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you've raised a point that uh, I wanted to be sure we did lay the foundation for, and it's this, that when we talk about God creating a man and woman in his image, we're talking about that moment however you conceive of the timing of it all, um, we're talking about that moment in which God makes human beings a special part of his creation. Another part of Genesis 1 is the idea that the last thing that God creates in this week is humanity. He stands at and she stand at the pinnacle of this creation. Uh, man in chapter 2 is the pinnacle of the creation, and yet the creation is incomplete until woman is created and completes the creation of the humanity that we see in the image of God, male and female. All these things are important. They're important mm-hmm. for this discussion. They're actually important to other discussions we've had on this podcast that talk about issues of sexuality and gender, etc. So when we talk about a foundational chapter, uh, this is a important, uh, important starting point, and uh, it is very significant that we are in the first chapters of the first book of the Bible, and we're not located somewhere, you know, in the middle of the of the prophets somewhere, you know, somewhere down the road. This is this when we talk about the picture of a foundation, with all the issues that that brings philosophically and otherwise, that clearly is the way the Bible is laying itself out. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's an important mm-hmm. point to be made. Mm-hmm. We spent some time here on Genesis, and I think it's important to do so for that very reason. Nathan, you look like you wanted to say something. You want to dive in, or I'm, I'm oh, just reading your look? I was, I was nodding in absolute agreement. Okay. Well, we'll take that affirmation as uh, approval, a good housekeeping seal of approval, and we'll move <laughs> on. Um, Let's turn our attention next to uh, – we, we've already alluded to this and we can cover this briefly, but there are a series of genealogies that also are related in the Old Testament to this discussion. We've alluded to the genealogy in Genesis 5. There's a genealogy in First Chronicles 1. There's even a genealogy in the New Testament in Luke 3 that extends all the way back to Adam. So um, what does that tell us? One thing it tells us is that we're comparing individuals. Mm-hmm. Adam, along with the individuals that are part of that genealogy, are the individuality of Adam is clearly emphasized. Yes, and it almost assumed. I mean, it's yeah. it, it's uh, it's a given. Uh, yeah, to put it yes. to put a mythical character <laughs> or a categorical kind of statement of all humanity doesn't fit uh, the genealogical placement. Uh, ironically, the Genesis 5 links you to Adam himself and the human race. In First Chronicles 1, the nation of Israel, and especially as it develops from Adam to the Davidic dynasty. And then in Luke 3, uh, where Luke tracks it backwards, whereas Matthew tracks it forwards in history, Luke tracks it backwards to Adam and then, you know, as a son of God, as a creation, you know, uh, an offspring of God himself. And so uh, you, you have the genealogy of Jesus. So it's interesting that I found, you know, you have Adam, David, and Jesus, which is uh, linking, obviously, uh, not only humanity, but also then in the incarnation with the Son of God. One of the differences that you get, of course, between Matthew and Luke is that Matthew only goes back to Abraham. Exactly. But, uh, but Luke, because of his more universal concerns, although Matthew has them too, but Luke highlights them, goes all the way back to Adam. And then he, it is interesting that that genealogy ends with Adam, the son of God. Right. which is an allusion to this imago Dei, mm-hmm. to this being made in the image of God that right. we've talked about. So we're, 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 we're seeing multiple authors handle the text this way. That's, that's part of the point. That's and what seems here. apparent is Adam is not being viewed as a mythical figure, mm-hmm. right? and he's not being viewed corporately or collectively. Right. He's mm-hmm. an individual, mm-hmm. and he's an, an, an individual who live, uh, who began this uh, genealogical uh, tradition. And to come back to the point that you've made, we're explaining the origins of things. We're talking about mm-hmm. etiology here, and in explaining the origins of things, we're going back to the beginning of where it starts. And uh, you know, the, the the famous expression about the president is the buck stops here. Okay, <laughs> well, we're reversing this. The buck starts here. Okay, <laughs> it starts with Adam. Mm-hmm. All right, now let's go to. Uh, uh, another text. This is Hosea 6-7. This is probably a less well-known text, mm-hmm. and it also is discussed because of the way it reads. Uh, but uh, what does what might Hosea 6-7 be telling us about, about Adam? Well, some argue that this is an allusion to the Genesis story in Hosea. He does allude to Genesis in other places. He's aware of the Jacob uh, account. And so... Uh, if you understand this as a reference to the historical Adam, it's saying that Israel, like Adam, broke, violated a covenantal arrangement. Of course, then we get into the question of is there a creation covenant? I think Reformed interpreters tend to read Hosea 6 this way because it kind of supports their view of uh, a covenant, creation covenant. But there are textual issues here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Net Bible translates that second line, oh, how they were unfaithful to me. But actually in Hebrew, it's sham, there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have argued uh, someplace. (laughs) (laughs) Someplace I don't see it in the Net Bible notes. I think something that I published. Somewhere uh, somewhere it says. I think maybe in the – I did the Hosea in the Bible Knowledge Commentary way back when, and Uh I've written some things on on the prophet since. And I have argued that it's, Adam in the first line is really just a place name. Mm-hmm. It, it's a place name. It was a site where they were violating covenant. 
and you can uh, read the text that way and see then the second line there in mm -hmm. other words at this place Adam and in the context there are other locations that are mentioned uh, Gilead etc so I'm not so sure that this is an allusion to Adam um, there, there are some contextual reasons to doubt that mm -hmm. but if you go with that more traditional reading then it is an allusion to that event, and uh, it seems to assume that there was some covenant that Adam broke, even though that kind of language is not used of the arrangement in uh, in Genesis so 2 and 3. So the Hebrew here quite literally would read something like, at Adam they broke the covenant? Uh, well, you can – to really do that, you probably would need to amend the text from uh, like Adam to in Adam. Okay. Yeah, but bait and cough can be easily confused, and so that would not be a difficult – um, change to make. But I you do see. have the sham in the second line, and that Bible is trying to understand sham more in the sense of oh how, some kind of interjection, mm -hmm. some kind of uh, idiomatic use of it. Uh, it. I don't think that's the, the more natural way of reading it. Sham there seems to uh, indicate we're talking about a place that's there, and that would be Adam. And there was a place, uh, Adam, that's mentioned, a location. It is a geographical name elsewhere. But if you were reading this as Adam, then it would be an allusion back to Genesis 3. I think 3. so, yeah. yeah. But, and it would imply that the arrangement between God and Adam uh, was covenantal in nature. And uh, those of us who are on the dispensational side have sometimes opposed that idea. Mm -hmm. We haven't always as a seen it as a creation-type covenant. Yeah, yeah. There, there are there are sub dispensationalists who have argued for an Edenic covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's different than the than the Reformed mm -hmm. theological covenant. Okay. So it would be what, however you would describe that covenant, it would assume that there is a covenant uh, there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Would the there if you took the first line as Adam? Could there they have dealt treacherously with me be in reference back to the garden setting, or is that do you think that's straining it, Bob? Well, I, I think it would be saying that in this context, Hosea is saying that the people of Israel in his time, uh, and the book is all about covenantal violation. Sure. They, like Adam, have broken a covenant, uh, and the Hebrew text just says breed. Uh, it's just a covenant. There's no article there, mm -hmm. um, so it's it's simply saying that the people of Hosea's time. Uh, have violated God's requirements and standards just like Adam did. Yeah. Uh, now there is uh, in, in, in Second Temple Judaism this belief that there were covenant relationships that extended back before Abraham. Mm -hmm. There also are are commands and relationships set up in the early chapters of Genesis. That's for sure. They're told to be fruitful and multiply. They're told. Uh, uh, they're they're told not to eat certain things and to eat certain things. So there are stipulations, if you want to put it that way. So you uh, you may not have formal Barit full is not covenant. Used. That's yeah. right, but you have elements that certainly could suggest that God created man to enter into a certain mm -hmm. kind of relationship with humanity, and in, at least in that loose sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, some have this. seen that the covenant with Noah alludes back to an earlier covenant. That's some right. have, and Dumbrell right. has, uh, and others have. Chapter seven. 6. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because there is clearly covenantal language used w when you get to Noah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we put a question mark by yeah, Hosea. Yeah. Uh, not sure about it. Uh, but uh, let me ask uh, we got our theologian here uh, by long distance. I don't want to exclude him. If he has anything he wants to say about genealogies or Hosea that he wants to add into the mix, he has anything he wants to say about covenant. Um, this uh, passage in Hosea does have a long history in the development of uh, covenant theology mm -hmm. in, in the post-Reformation period. It's a very, uh, a very hot spot in Scripture precisely because if you read it, as Dr. Chisholm mentioned, like Adam, then you've got one of the most explicit um, affirmations in Scripture of a pre-fall covenant, mm -hmm. which obviously is going to be critical. Uh, to a, a covenant or federal theology. So it's it's been uh, well worn and uh, deeply discussed, and, and I would completely agree that uh, I put a question mark by it, because as a dispensationalist, I'd prefer to read it at Adam, they transgress the covenant, but the lo location. That, that could be uh, my bias speaking. So I, I'm, I'm going to be happy with a question mark. Uh, I think it is fair to say, though, as we've commented earlier, that there are, regardless of what you do with the technical handling of the 
concept of bereed and covenant in this passage. There are elements that suggest it clearly that God is entering into a relationship with mm-hmm. human beings in this chapter. I mean, you can't – if you talk about yes. a foundation, you have to assume that for the rest of the story. And yep. whether you label that covenant or not, there is clearly something going on here that lays the foundation for the rest of God's relationship with, with that which he has created. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, that brings us – I'm going to go next to Second Temple texts, and, and people who are listening to us go, why in the world would you do that? Um, <laughs> Because uh, these are not biblical texts; these are texts written in the period, mostly in the intertestamental period between the Old and New Testaments. But they're Jewish texts, and they show how the text is being read by Jews in the time of Jesus. And I think that these are important texts because they help us to see that what we've been talking about is is not uh, strictly. Uh, Christian. It also is a Jewish way of reading the text, and is a one that is established in, in Jewish tradition. So, uh, I, I, you're seeing some of the people here flip pages on uh, because I've run these texts off for everybody. Um, it's they're not in my Bible. They're not in your Bible. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, but I want to expand your devotions anyway. Uh, um, but they are important. That's right. That's right. Um, the first text is from Tobit 8.6. I'm going to take all of them together. The first text is from Tobit 8.6, and it simply says this, You made Adam, and for him you made his wife Eve as helper and support. From the two of them the human race has sprung. You said, It is not good that man should be alone. Let us make a helper for him like himself. I don't think you need a degree in theology to interpret what that verse is saying. Uh, The second passage is from Sirach 49. And uh, this is actually in a chapter where uh, several figures are present, uh, Old Testament figures, and I'm just going to pick up the the end of the list. Um, Sirach 49.15 reads, uh, and then 16 is where Adam is mentioned. Sirach 49.15 reads, Nor was anyone ever born like Joseph. Even his bones were cared for. We, we know what that's alluding to, of course. And then Sirach 49.16 reads, Shem and Seth and Enosh were honored, but above every other created living being was Adam. Hmm. Okay, again, don't think you need a PhD in Ugaritic to figure <laughs> out what that is saying. And then the last passage is a chapter in Second Ezra, also known as Fourth Ezra, chapter seven. This book is debated as to when it was written, but many place its date about A.D. 100. Uh, there also the chapter has two versions, one of which showed up in the Vulgate and the other didn't. So it has two different versifications, which is important because some of what I'm going to read is going to appear only in one version of this chapter. But one of the texts says this, this is 2 Ezra 7.11, uh, says, For I made the world for their sake, when Adam transgressed my statutes, what has been made was judged. That's in one verse what we talked about when we talked about Genesis 3. And then much further on in the alternate version, we have the following verses. I can get there. <laughs> And this is either 2 Ezra 7, 1, 14 or verse 44. I'm going to start there, actually verse 43, um, and then run through several verses where uh, Adam is discussed. It's talking about it in the day of judgment. It, uh, it says, but the day of judgment will be the end of this age and the beginning of the immortal age to come. The chapter itself is discussing the age. The, the judgment day and what's going to happen at the end, in which corruption has passed away, sinful indulgence has come to an end, unbelief has been cut off, and righteousness has increased, and truth has appeared. Therefore, no one will then be able to have mercy on someone who has been condemned in the judgment or to harm someone who is victorious. Now, here we go. I answered and said, this is my first and last comment. It would have been better if the earth had not produced Adam, or else when it produced him had restrained him from sinning. For what good is it to all that they live in sorrow now and expect punishment after death? O Adam, what have you done? For though it was you who sinned, the fall was not yours alone, 
but ours also who are your descendants. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to discuss the implications of what has come on humanity as a result of what it is that Adam has done. Mm -hmm. This might be the clearest Jewish text on what Christians have called the fall um, in Second Temple literature. And it, 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 it's interesting because it gets, you get this address of pain, if you mm -hmm. will, to, uh, to Adam about what it is that he has foisted onto the human race. Um, so those are the texts. The floor is open uh, to all my Second Temple Jewish experts here to comment on them. Uh, I do think it's revealing, uh, and that's why I brought them into the discussion, because these are texts contemporary to the time of the New Testament for the most part, and so we're seeing how the text is being read. Any? What's interesting, the transgression of the statutes mm -hmm. sounds a little bit like the traditional interpretation of Hosea 6. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting how this whole philosophical issue of why did God go ahead and create it would have been better if he just not created us at all. Right. That emerges here. I find that interesting. Yeah, yeah. You get uh, – and sometimes you get uh, um, uh, issues that, that touch on the edge of theodicy uh, mm -hmm. in relationship to the yeah. presence of sin in some of these texts. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the assumption is there was an historical Adam. Adam. That's, the, the, that's the point. That. It's clear. And again, it's from many writers. Mm -hmm. It's not – we're not just picking one. Uh, it, it's across a, a series of, of people who are writing. And Adam acted as a character in history, mm -hmm. and his the consequence of his action mm -hmm. is experienced by us, which yeah. are theological truths which the New Testament certainly makes more explicit, but are understood apparently at this early point in Jewish history. Yeah, I think this is going to set up some of the things that we're going to see in the New Testament pretty nicely mm -hmm. in terms of, of uh, why there isn't more elaboration. Uh, in terms of some of the things that are said. Again, um, present reality is rooted in past event. That's if right. the event did not happen, I don't know what that does to your theological understanding of present reality. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I mean, you, I'll say it this way: you can get there if you make it a metaphor, but it's a lot more work, you know. It, yeah. it, you know, and it's clear they didn't understand it that that's way. Right. They, that's right. That's right. Direct. You could them. argue they were naive, misinformed. They didn't. They're not as sophisticated in their literary understanding of what's going on in Genesis. You could argue all of that, but. The fact is, they read it in a straightforward way. That's right. And the etiological dimension of the text itself suggests that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Terrell, in light of mm -hmm. the date of that, mm -hmm. would that also, if I can say this, it buttresses with when Jesus is talking about origins and he refers to Adam and Eve, their creation as a couple, mm -hmm. as the beginning, mm -hmm. and then the function of marriage in response to the question of divorce. Matthew 19 and Mark 10. Matthew 19 mm -hmm. and Mark 10. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no, obviously, he's not uh, hedging his bets that they're going to point a finger and say, well, that's mythological. That's right. Yeah. It, is, uh, it is rooted not only in history, but it's also rooted in what the Jewish people believed as evidenced by these kinds of writings. That's right. And, and, and like I say, I just think it's interesting to have these texts on the table because I think they show something about the way in which the text was being read at the time. Nathan, you have anything to add to what we're saying here? Yeah, actually, I, I do. I, I, I think maybe we just heard a, a preview of uh, an idea that shows up when Paul writes the letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 8, where he brings the concept of the whole creation groaning mm -hmm. uh, because it's been subjected to futility. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there might be uh, a steady stream of this kind of understanding that, that undergirds the passage we read in Second Esdras and perhaps even Paul's own understanding of this. So uh, I'm excited to get to Romans 8. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.